Hello, um, I'm Johnny Chiodini. I am senior video producer for a website called Eurogamer.net, which is an independent gaming site. In other words, I make videos about video games. I first joined the games industry in 2008 when I looked, there it is, there's my name. I like to spell it out phonetically, it makes me feel like a species of dinosaur. <laughs> but I joined the games industry in 2008 when I looked like this. I um, thought that was a good way to dress myself. And I started an internship at Independent Television News. I worked there for three years before moving to a website called GameSpot for a further three years. And then I went freelance for a year, during which time I helped Channel 4 make a program called Two Players. And then in 2015, I joined the Eurogamer team. Now, that's my career history, but I also have another history, one millions of people worldwide share, but comparatively few people are comfortable discussing. And that's my history with mental health. I've suffered from depression and anxiety since I was about 14 years old, but I wasn't diagnosed until 2012. I took antidepressants for two years and also underwent a course of cognitive behavioural therapy, both of which I found to be extremely useful. I still have my rough patches, of course, but all in all I feel pretty well equipped to deal with my issues. I'm very comfortable, in fact, talking about my disorders and what it's like to live with them, and for that reason I feel incredibly lucky. So many people across the world, men especially, find it extremely difficult to talk about mental health and there's still a tremendous amount of stigma attached to the topic. So why am I telling you all of this? Well, as you've probably guessed, video games and mental health are two topics very close to my heart. I make a show for Eurogamer called Low Batteries, which seeks to examine how the two interact. That's what led me to be invited to do this talk, and it's what leads me to this question. Can a video game save a life? Now, for me, the answer to that question is an immediate and unequivocal yes, but I realise a seven-word question with a one-word answer doesn't really make for the most interesting of discussions. So why don't we try this? How can a video game save a life? Well, firstly, video games make us feel good, and we're going to come back to that in a second, but first, I need you to understand video games are absolutely everywhere. The biggest video game in the world right now is a game called League of Legends. It's what we call a MOBA, or a multiplayer online battle arena game. In a game of League of Legends, two teams of players face off as op at opposite ends of a map, and they try to destroy one another, basically. And in 2014, 67 million people worldwide played this game every single month. During peak gameplay hours in 2014, 7.5 million people could be found playing this video game at the same time. To put that into perspective, the population of London, which is where I'm from, in 2014 was 8.5 million, just one million more. So try and imagine a city, if you can, in which every single day, at the same time, seven out of eight people stop whatever it is they're doing, go to a computer, log in, and start playing the same video game. League of Legends is absolutely vast, and it's also very tactically complicated. If, as a League of Legends player, you've got less than 500 hours on the clock, you're still considered a novice. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, we have games like Candy Crush. Candy Crush is criminally simple, and yet it is also played by millions of people worldwide every single day. If you get on a bus or a train, you are practically guaranteed to run into somebody playing this game. You don't even need to look very hard to see it. You can just watch the movement of their thumb and the slightly glazed expression on their faces. <laughs> but anyway, this game is, is played by millions. And between these two games, between the very, very simple Candy Crush and the very, very complicated League of Legends, we have all sorts of games designed and aimed at different devices, different age groups, and different demographics. Video gaming really has permeated every level of society. Now, according to mental health charity Mind, one in four people in the UK alone will experience a difficulty with mental health every single year. I'm not trying to say that there's a causal link between these two things, but you don't need me to draw you a Venn diagram to understand the crossover between people who enjoy video games and people who suffer with mental health is pretty significant. As it is, I have drawn you a Venn diagram. <laughs> It's just not very scientific. <laughs> so video games are absolutely everywhere, great, but they also make us feel good. Now, how does that work? 
Well, pretty much every video game in the world is designed along the same principles. You challenge your player, and then you reward your player for completing whatever challenge it is you've set them. Here's an example. This is Tetris, one of the best known video games in the entire world. As you probably know, blocks come down from the top of the screen and you arrange them to complete horizontal rows. When you finish a row, it disappears and you get some points. But if the blocks reach the top of the screen, it's game over. Pretty simple. And that's all very lovely and tactile and wonderful and engaging. But the thing is, if you really know your Tetris, you'll probably spend most of your time playing like this. Stacking all of the blocks to one side of the screen and deliberately leaving a gap one square wide on the opposite end. All because you're waiting for that block up there, the straight four. Now this little tetramino, that's what they're called, tetraminos, it slots in there and it takes out four rows at once in a beautiful move called, wait for it, a Tetris. And when you get a Tetris, you get a load of points, great, but you also get a little sound effect and you get a flashing animation. And that's this game's way of saying, well done, you've done something pretty good. Because playing like this is actually kind of a gamble. So when it pays off and you get your Tetris, you feel really good about yourself. You feel smart and dynamic and you feel like you're in control of your own destiny. But more than that, you feel like you're good at being in control of your own destiny. Now that little pip of satisfaction, that feeling that you've done something of which you can be proud, that's actually surprisingly rare for somebody suffering from a mental health disorder like, for instance, depression. So for somebody to be distracted from their problems, however briefly, and made to feel good about something they've done, that's actually pretty special. I've done some work with this, again, with my uh, show Low Batteries, talking about the concept of the sad game. Now the idea behind the sad game is, People suffering from depression will sometimes have a video game towards which they gravitate when things are particularly bad. The idea is it distracts their active minds just long enough to give them a bit of a breather between themselves and the immediacy of their problems. I myself have used these games extensively. I also happen to be very, very good at Tetris. <laughs> so video games are absolutely everywhere and video games make us feel good, tremendous. But video games have also come on in leaps and bounds since 1984 when Tetris was first introduced. Now we have games coming out every single year designed around cooperation, around communication, and around fostering communities. Now these game communities, each one designed around a different video game, they're designed to celebrate the game everyone's playing, sure, but they're also designed to get people sharing their own experiences and paying attention to the experiences of others. In other words, these communities being fostered around video games are designed to get people reaching out to others and helping them have a better time. And ultimately, that is exactly the kind of support network somebody suffering with a mental health disorder ought to have access to. Now, in 2010, Jane McGonigal gave a fantastic TED talk called Gaming Can Make a Better World. It's really inspirational. I suggest you find it and you watch it. In her talk, she said, Gaming can make a better world by inspiring people to be the best they can possibly be and then go out there and solve real world problems. She said games make people hardworking, communicative, and a third thing. Very specifically, she described people who play video games as super empowered, hopeful individuals. Now, wouldn't that be a beautiful way to be able to describe somebody when talking about them in reference to their mental health? So where do we go from here? How do we take this wonderfully ubiquitous medium and use it to reach people suffering from hidden, very often secret illnesses? In my opinion, the answer is we engage with people from inside the games industry and out. So we make more games about mental health, sure, but we also get people talking about those games more and their own experiences. And thankfully, there's already a trend towards this happening. We have story games like Life is Strange, which is a beautiful game that weaves themes of depression and suicide around some of its core characters. Papo and Yo is a game that seeks to examine how addiction can impact on a family unit. And there are also games like Flowey with a more therapeutic bent. Now, Flowey is a game designed for people who suffer from anxiety and from panic attacks. The idea is when you feel a panic attack coming, and you recognize those symptoms, you start playing flowy and it starts, uh, starts getting you to breathe more regularly and it distracts you. And that helps you calm down and master your own symptoms and hopefully basically arrest a panic attack. 
And there are also experiences like Virtual Iraq. Virtual Iraq is a virtual therapeutic experience aimed at combat war veterans from the Iraq War who are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. As you can see, it's a virtual experience, so you put on a headset and a set of headphones, and they even pipe smells into the room where appropriate. And it plunges you into a digital representation of the streets of Iraq. It starts at a very low, very safe intensity, but then gradually over the course of several sessions, they introduce new elements of danger until ultimately the patient ends up confronting the traumatic event that led to their PTSD in the first place. All of these are remarkable experiences and we've already seen them come out and they're available to people. But video games continue to advance at the same time. So each year we're seeing games reaching more people and becoming more accessible, but also more people are turning their own hands to game creation and becoming game makers in their own right. So each year, what we're seeing from these people who are suddenly engaged with this medium is a greater variety of stories and experiences, and mental health is starting to occupy a bigger space within that medium. And we need to do everything we can to encourage that. Because we have these communities, they're ready-made, they're already there, and they're very used to talking to one another. So if we can just get them talking about their experiences with mental health at the same time, we have the potential to construct a truly fantastic support network. We have the opportunity to combat mental health stigma from inside one of the largest and most talkative communities in the entire world. We could, if we continue, in, continue to engage with mental health in an open, honest and direct way, we could build a future in which people are just as comfortable talking about their mental health as their high scores, their lap times, and their flawless victories. And ultimately, there's no telling how many lives that could save. So what do I want from you once this talk is done? What do I want you to take away from this? That really depends on how you define yourself in relation to video games. If you've never played a video game before, or maybe you haven't touched one since 1984, I want you to find one, and I want you to play it. I want you to think about video games as a medium and try and understand why they reach so many people, so many million pe millions of people, and why they matter to them. If you consider yourself to be a gamer, I want you to push yourself a little bit further. I want you to find a game specifically about mental health, and I want you to play it and think about how that makes you feel. Did it teach you anything? Is there anything you can relate to in there? What's good about the depiction in the game? What's bad about the depiction in the game? And no matter who you are, and no matter whether you care about video games or not, if you never pick up a video game again in your entire life, I want you to talk about mental health more. I want you to talk about your own experiences. I want you to ask other people about theirs and listen to those experiences. Because mental health stigma isn't going to go away by itself. It requires your dedication, your passion, your input, and your interaction, just like a good video game. Thanks. <laughs>